All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is Sunday, February 6th. Uh, another vlog video. Um, last week we talked about post gaming, and I thought that uh, it only made sense to talk about uh, pre game this week. Um, now, this is actually something that I'm going to break up into two into two videos, two separate videos. Um, I, I think there's a lot of content around the space of, um, you know, good, good pre-gaming. And I think a lot of times too, the content that you want to include in your pre-game is largely dependent on um, the officials involved and how frequently you have worked with the officials involved. You know, I just, as, as an example, um, about two hours ago, I got done officiating a game with Craig Bauer and Sharon Sawyers. Uh, Craig and I have worked a lot of games together. Sharon and I have worked a lot of games together and Sharon and Craig have worked a lot of games together. So um, that doesn't mean that we didn't do a thorough pregame. What it meant was, uh, you know, we probably weren't going to talk a lot about, you know, what, 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 what do you see as, as the trail? What do you see as the lead? What, what do you see as the C? What are your keys? Uh, some of the things that, again, between the three of us, uh, we've probably been officiating for a combined 70 years and we've all worked together um, quite a bit. So, uh, you know, our pregame was focused more on game management, on administration, on just making sure that what needed to be taken care of was actually taken care of during the game. Um, but again, uh, one of the things that I'll always say is if you ever are unsure uh, how thorough of a pregame or what content to include in your pregame, I would always err on the side of being more informational than less, uh, especially if you're working with an official who you haven't worked with before. Maybe they haven't done a lot of, uh, or I should say, maybe they haven't officiated a lot of games. Um, if they're transitioning from two man, I'm sorry, if they're transitioning from two person to three person, like all of those factors should come into consideration. So, um, and again, the, the, the R should uh, make the determination about what content's going to be in the pregame, but that doesn't mean that the other official or the other two officials in the room uh, shouldn't be given an opportunity to add in and supplement what the R is saying. Uh, you know, as the R, I always tell, um, if I'm doing two person or three person, I always tell the other official or officials if, if, you, if you have anything to interject, please feel free to do so at any time because I am not, you know, I, I realize that I am not the uh, be all end all of, of good pre-gaming. And if there's something specific that another official wants to talk about, by all means, uh, they should be included in that conversation. So with that being said, I've got three slides today um, and then we'll break up next week. Um, I have, the first guest ever um, in, 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 the, in the vlog post that I'm doing. So uh, we'll do uh, part one of pre-gaming this week. We'll take a break for the special guest next week. And then the week after we'll, we'll go back to the second part of pre-gaming. And that would be, um, let's see, that would be February 20th, uh, which would put us kind of towards the end of the, of the regular season, which um, February 27th was kind of the date I had earmarked as, as the last day for the vlog post this year. So um, we've got some scheduled content coming up. Um, so I'll get into part one of pre-gaming. The, the first thing that I always like to, I, I, one of the things that I try to do with my pre-game is to get everyone thinking about basketball. I mean, obviously, um, if, if we're working if I'm working the second game of the night, or if I'm working behind a game that that's already that's taking place, um, you know, I'm probably half paying attention to the game that I'm watching in front of me. So a lot of times what, what I like to do, or if we're the first game of the night, the first question that I always ask is, you know, how, how has this season looked for you? Um, have you had any, any uncommon plays? Have you had any uncommon situations? or uncommon occurrences, just, just talking about basketball in general. Um, you know, again, I, I hearken back to the conversation that Craig 
and Sharon and I had today uh, as we were waiting for the game in front of us to get done. We were talking about some uncommon plays that each one of us had seen this year. And it was really nice because it kept our focus. I had already pre-gamed. I had pre-gamed for about 10 minutes before the game. And then we found out that the game in front of us had gone into overtime. So uh, we kept our basketball conversation going by talking to one another about what we had seen so far this season. So, and I think that type of discussion uh, is not only always warranted, but I would definitely, uh, I would definitely recommend it. Second part, discussion regarding previous experience with either team during the season. So one of the things that uh, usually organically comes up in the officials locker room before the game, or uh, if it doesn't, I'm, I'm always raising my hand and asking the question, but who, who had these teams uh, in the past? Have you had them this season? Did you have them last season? What happened when you had them last? Uh, what kind of offense did they run? What kind of defense did they run? Did they press? Did they trap? Uh, were they, you know, were they predicated on half court? Were they run and gun? Just again, trying to get yourself in the mindset of officiating basketball, number one. Number two, it kind of gives you an idea about what you can expect. With that being said, you, you want to try to take previous experience with a grain of salt because we don't want anyone going on the court with any preconceived notions because that could negatively affect your officiating. So for me, I am more interested in styles of offense, styles of defense, pressing and trapping. What, is, what does that look like if one of my partners uh, has had one of those teams previously in the season? The, the next thing I will start by going into what our pregame meeting or what our pregame will look like when we're actually on the court, right? So um, the captains and coaches meeting at the 13 minute mark. I always ask the crew in the locker room before the game, is there anything specific that you want me to address with the players and with the coaches, or excuse me, with the captains and the coaches? And the reason I do this is because my pregame meetings with, cap with captains and coaches are pretty short. And in the 20 years I've been officiating, here are some of the reasons why I have kept it short. Um, number one, the players don't care in the slightest bit. Um, if they are half listening, I would be surprised. I think they're a quarter listening and they're more concerned about getting back to their teams to go through layup lines or free throws or whatever they do prior to the game. So the reality of the situation is the players don't care. Now, that doesn't mean that we can uh, just not have a pregame because that's, that's not the case at all. There's still some very specific information that we want to bring across. And if the players don't care, the coaches barely care. Uh, they've, again, if we're pre-gaming the right way, they've heard all of this information before. They're used to answering all, all of the questions. But many times I just get the deer in the headlights look from the coaches that means either A, they're not listening very well, or B, they just want to get through it as quickly as possible. However, like I said here, this doesn't mean we should take the importance of this meeting lightly. We keep it short, we keep it concise, we keep it to the point, okay? So with players, I'm covering one thing, and that's sportsmanship. And what I'm saying is I'm reminding those players that they are captains for a reason. Their coaches trust them with being leaders on the floor and off the floor. So our expectation as a crew for those captains is that they will help us on sportsmanship related issues and certainly not exacerbate the problem. And then with coaches, I'm reiterating sportsmanship that it begins and ends with them. They wield a lot of power. Now I'm not gonna say you wield a lot of power on your players and your fans, but I try to make it as evident as possible that we understand as officials that the players take a lot of their cues from their coach. Uh, 
always asking, are your players legally and properly equipped? Going over the coach's box dimensions, 28 foot line down to the end line. And then the importance of getting players out of the timeouts on the first horn. I want the expectation to be that we will give you a whistle and warn you that we had the first horn. Then we as officials are going to take our places on the court. The second horn comes. If players are making their way onto the court, I'm probably going to give them a little leeway. But if a coach hasn't broken that huddle and we've had two horns, I'm putting the ball on the floor and starting a five second count. So the reality of the situation is I want coaches to know that our expectation as a crew is that we're getting players out of timeouts when they hear the first horn. Then I, back to the pregame in the locker room, I'm going to go over with the crew that I will be meeting with the table at the 10 minute mark to go through the books, um, talk to the, uh, the timekeeper, the clock operator. And I also wanna know, is there anything as a crew that you want me to address in this meeting? Okay. Now, in the captains and coaches meeting, obviously I'm always going to give the other, the other official or the other two officials the opportunity to add anything. But when it comes to the table meeting, a lot of times it's difficult because I'm the only official as the R that's over at the table. So if there are any messages that the other official or the other two officials want me to address with the table, I need to know that ahead of time. And I need to give the other two officials the opportunity to tell me what they want me to talk to the table about. Now, when I'm at the table, when I'm the R and I'm at the table and I'm pre-gaming at the table prior to the game, I'm delivering a couple different messages. Number one, I'm telling the clock operator to give two horns coming out of timeouts and quarter breaks. I always want two horns. The second thing that I'm doing is I'm taking the home book and I'm verifying with both head coaches that numbers and starters are accurate. I don't really care about names. Names are irrelevant to me. Are the right numbers in the book? Are the right number of players in the book? And are the correct starters identified? So that when I take it back to the table and I put our crew's stickers in the book or write names and numbers in whatever I'm doing, I can sign off on that book knowing that both coaches have looked at the home book and we are operating accordingly with a home book that's accurate. Now, is it important that the number of players in the visiting book matches the home book? Yeah, I'm going to check that. But if we have a, an issue with a player not being in the book before the game or a starter change, the home book is going to be what I use as my Bible, both before the game and once the game gets started. And then uh, back to pre-gaming in the locker room, I want to cover with the other officials on my crew that we are going to enforce guidelines for legal, legally and properly equipped players during warmups taking wristbands or excuse me, taking um, either whether it be hair ties or rubber bands off the wrists, uh, checking in, in girls basketball or sometimes in boys, you know, sometimes boys wear longer hair, making sure that there's no metal or sharp objects in the hair, checking um, to make sure all the players are legally equipped, properly equipped, that undergarments and sleeves and all of that stuff you know, follow the guidelines, the color guidelines outlined by the MHSAA. All of that, I want to make sure that we handle whatever we can handle prior to the game. 
Now, again, there's always going to be those situations where teams wear warmups, they go over to the bench. You don't know that they're improperly equipped until they take off their warmups. Okay. But any preventative officiating that you can do prior to those teams going to their benches to start the game, I'm going to do it. I'm also checking any, uh, I've seen a couple of times in the past week or two, there's been some players that wear tape on their hands. I'm making sure that everything related to that tape or that injury is soft. There should be nothing hard or sharp on that player's hand or hands or arms for that matter, okay? So if you see a player with tape on his or her fingers or hand or whatever, make sure you're going over prior to the game and checking to make sure that it is soft and there's no hard elements to it. Okay, so the next thing, um, now, now I'm going to move more towards some philosophy of officiating. Number one, that we the importance of focusing for all 32 minutes. A blowout doesn't mean we can stop officiating. A blowout doesn't mean that we can stop rotating. A blowout doesn't mean that uh, you know a, 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 a hard foul shouldn't be called an intentional foul. These are all things that we want to, we always preach consistency, 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 consistency. Be consistent for 32 minutes. Now, you'll see further down the screen, I'm talking about time score and situation. That's going to be a little bit more for your game interrupter type penalty or violation. But what I'm talking about is hard fouls, intentional fouls, technical fouls. Again, rotating to where the ball is. Um, ball goes out of bounds, taking the ball out of bounds where it should be where it's supposed to be taken out of bounds. All of those are focus elements. And we owe it to the players, the coaches, the schools that are paying us that we don't stop officiating regardless of what ha is happening on the court. We don't fall asleep. We don't lose focus. We are there to officiate for 32 minutes. And we need to be officiating for all 32 of those minutes. Next. I'll talk about addressing questions from coaches, not addressing comments. The importance of shutting down any yelling across the court emanating for, from a coach. Kevin Sinicki likes to call, call these shout outs where the coach wants to talk to the official who just called the foul. Now the official is opposite table on the other side of the floor and that official wants to ask or excuse me, that coach wants to ask that official a question. There's a more than competent official standing right in front of you. Ask that official your question. And if it can't be answered, there's plenty of rotations that will take place. You can ask that official your question later on in the game. It could be 30 seconds later, it could be three minutes later. And if that coach shows a propensity for shouting out across the floor all the time, that is either a warning or a, an offense that is uh, worthy of a technical foul. So keep the coach from just making comment after comment after comment. If it gets to be too much, either warn the coach or tee the coach, especially if that coach is yelling across the floor. Another thing that I remind my partners is be ready to use the lexicon and the verbiage from the rule book if a coach asks a question about a call you made. Probably the most questioned call in basketball is the block charge. Okay. And a lot of times, I think the default, and, and I see this when I watch basketball on TV all the time. Analysts on TV think that a player moving is the key indicator of whether it was a block or a charge. It's not whether the player is moving. The first thing that needs to be established is legal guarding position. Two feet and shoulders pointed towards the offensive player. That is your key. 
for whether it was a block or a charge. And when a coach questions you, why did you call that a block? Coach, the player didn't have legal guarding position. Why did you call that a charge? Coach, player had two feet and shoulders pointed at the ball handler. That's legal guarding position. The offensive player initiated the contact. We're going the other way. Be ready to use the lexicon and the verbiage from the rule book when you're explaining your rulings to an official, or excuse me, to a coach. Next, we'll cover effective game management. Is the clock starting and stopping when it's supposed to? In my opinion, clock errors should be addressed the same way in the first quarter and the fourth quarter. Three minutes left in the first quarter, you see the clock not stop for eight seconds, and you know with 100% certainty that eight seconds ran off that clock when it shouldn't have, put the time back on the clock in the first quarter so that when it comes time for the fourth quarter and you need to do the same thing, you're not questioned by the coaches who will say, we had the same situation in the first quarter. Why didn't you address it in the first quarter the way you did in the fourth quarter? Honestly, watching the clock and making sure it's stopping and starting at the right times keeps my head in the game, keeps me focused. And it's not like I have to watch the clock for three or four seconds I glance up, make sure it starts. I'm back, I'm diverting my eyes back to the game. We have a foul, we have a violation and I'm not the calling official. Boom, eyes go up to the clock for maybe a half second. Did it stop? Yep, back on the court. This, this takes practice. I, I, it's not easy. I'm still working on it. I started trying to do this more effectively three or four years ago and I'm still working on it. I'm not great at it by any means, but the best officials have great clock management. They know when it starts, they know when it stops, they know uh, if time came off when it shouldn't have, they know if the clock stopped too early. Whatever the case may be, effective game, this fits right into effective game management. And then effective communication. We're gonna communicate when we're in a one-on-one -on -one situation, we're going to communicate when we're in a double bonus situation. We're going to communicate when there's one minute left in each quarter and who has the ball. That's something that I apologize I didn't include in here, but I said who had the ball. Who has the last second shot? Okay, and it's always going to be, uh, well, I should say this. In two person, it's going to be the trail official. In three person, it's going to be either the trail or the center official, whoever is opposite table. So that the table can clearly see when the, uh, so that, I'm sorry, so that the table can clearly see um, if there are any violations, any penalties, clock starting and stopping, all of that needs to be seen by the table. And then signaling that you had 10 verified players on the court and you're ready for play. Always make sure you're counting players coming out of timeouts, uh, substitutions, coming out from between quarters or at halftime. Always make sure you have 10 players on the court. Referee. The referee that is administering a throw-in, keep your eyes on the official who's bringing substitutes into and out of the game. Don't watch the subs coming in and out of the game. Watch the official who is bringing subs in and out of the game. Because what inevitably is going to happen if you don't watch the official who's, uh, who's responsible for bringing the subs in and out, what's going to happen is a sub's going to run out. You might not realize another sub came into the game. Your partner has their hand up, but you're administering the ball. So a long time ago, I got in the habit of focusing my sole 100% attention. If I'm, if I'm administering a throw-in, my sole attention is going to be on the official who is bringing subs in 
and watching them go off the court. That doesn't mean that when that official tells me they're ready to go, I'm not counting the players on the court myself because I am doing that. But my first cue is when the other official brings their hand down. That indicates to me that they've got 10 players and they're ready to play. I, as the person administering the throw-in, am also going to do my count at that time, making sure we have 10, and then I'm administering the ball for the throw-in. Sportsmanship issues. I think this is very key to pregame with your partner or your partners. Always keeping your eyes open, keeping your awareness heightened for any baiting, taunting, rough play that happens during the game. And what you don't want to do is let the first offense go unpunished. Officials are very good at adjudicating penalties for the retaliation. We're not great at keeping our eyes on the play so that we can see what initiated the retaliation. Good game awareness keeping your eyes on the players, focus for 32 minutes. This all ties in and, play, and it plays together. In my pregame, I'm going to ask my other partner or my other two partners, are we going to try to talk players out of fouls and violations? And, and here's the thing, my voice carries especially in a court that echoes, my voice carries and it's loud. So if I'm telling a player to keep her hands off or I'm telling a player to get out of the lane because he's been in there for three seconds, many people in the gym are going to hear it. I, my volume button does not work very well on my voice. So I try to modulate my volume as best I can. But I also give my, I also let my partners know if we're in a situation where I'm talking to a player and I know that everyone in the gym can hear me, or at least the players and the coaches can hear me, I'm just calling the penalty. I'm just calling the violation. I'm calling the foul, whatever it is, because I don't want to, I don't want a coach to overhear that I'm telling a player to get out of the lane for three seconds. And then we go down to the other end of the floor five minutes later and call an egregious, you know, three second call. Okay. So my, I'm always going to default to, if I see a violation, I'm calling the violation. I am going to talk them out of things as best I can, but I also know the volume of my voice and I know how detrimental it could be if a coach or players hear that you're giving a little leeway to one player on one end and then what they perceive to be the same play on the other end gets called a foul or a violation even though you think the two penalties are different or excuse me the two yeah the two um fouls or violations are different they're different situations players and coaches aren't going to perceive it that way i can promise you okay so if you're going to try to talk players out of fouls and violations, just be sure that you know how to effectively manage the game if you have a situation that isn't a one-to-one. -one. Late game fouling. Making a legitimate play on the ball is required. Cover this in your pregame with, um, with your crew, please. Remind your crew that grabbing, holding, and slapping by the defense is not a legitimate play on the ball and should, and should be deemed an intentional foul. A couple of weeks ago, I had a game. Uh, a girl looked me straight in the eye and kept eye contact with me while she was grabbing her opponent and bear hugging her. Yes, the player had the ball, but that's not making a play on the ball. That's not a basketball play. When I see you making eye contact with me while you are bear hugging your opponent, 
that tells me that you're trying to get a foul and you're not making a play on the ball while you're doing it. Okay. So making sure that in late game fouling situations, we know what's a legitimate play on the ball, what's not a legitimate play on the ball, and how we are going to come out of an intentional foul situation. Who's going to shoot? Where's the ball going to go? How are we going to get the ball back in play? What does all of that look like? Okay. So that's it for uh, this week, this week's log. Again, like I said, we will have part two of pre-gaming in two weeks on the 20th of February. Next week, we have a special surprise guest, um, emphasis on surprise. I am trying to get everyone to tune in by not telling you who the surprise guest is. Um, you will have to uh, keep an eye out for your email or tune in to find out next week, but we are gonna break up the pre-gaming into um, two sections. Uh, this was week one and week two will come on February 20th. Other than that, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone.